And another thing to note is that there are, um, if you were to match up a turbo to your engine size, I mean obviously you can't slap on this T3 onto like a 1.5 liter engine and expect it to spool up when you want it to. It's not going to spool up to later in the RPM range. So there are calculators out there, you can Google them. You just type in a uh, turbo uh, engine CFM calculator and basically you enter your engine size, the displacement, um, the efficiency, and the max RPM and basically it'll calculate exactly how much airflow it needs for the amount of boost you want to run. So then there you take a compressor map that comes with pretty much every turbo that's made that tells you exactly how much CFM it produces at a certain pressure ratio. So I mean if you're going to be running let's say this T25 here on a 3 liter V6. I mean, obviously it was already having trouble flowing enough air for my KA, which is a 2.4, so I'm not going to do very well on a, on a V6. So the compressor map will help you basically um, figure that out before you buy the turbo. And the compressor map is pretty much a chart basically telling you if you were to run this at 15 pounds on a V6, it would be off of its efficiency chart, meaning that this turbo is basically not doing anything at that point. It's just a hot air pump. Um, so you would use the calculator to basically match a turbo, which is what I did to get this TDO 620G. This turbo matched up fairly nice for what I wanted to run, which was 15 pounds. I didn't want a lot of lag. The old Godspeed spooled up at around 3500 to 3700 RPM, which isn't too bad for the size of turbo that it is. And it's able to flow um, up to 25 pounds and still be within its, its efficiency island on the compressor map. So, I mean, you can use that. I mean, I, I would show you photos, but I mean, it's a little too much to explain over a video. But there's tons of uh, threads and articles online that basically explain how to use a, a CFM calculator and pair it up with a compressor map and choose the right size turbo for your, your needs or your application. So, that being said, as the same thing as there is with an AR here, there's an AR for this, the compressor housing. But, um... Most turbos, they, like I said, they come stamped and they'll let you know what it is and you can just click online and see exactly what would be nice to be paired up on against your turbo or against your engine. Then another thing to note, there's two different types of turbos. There's ball bearing and journal bearing turbos. These three here, or all of them that you see here, they're all journal bearing, which means they they rotate, the shaft rotates on a like a bronze bushing almost like something that you would see like on the pilot bushing for a clutch uh, the transmission input shaft something like that so I mean it's important to have oil there the correct amount of oil as I mentioned in the previous video the oil restrictor is really important for these turbos or any turbo um, um, but yeah the ball bearing turbo obviously you know ball bearings the pretty much have almost no friction so they spool up incredibly quick but the reason why smaller turbos like these 20 G's here they don't come ball bearing is because they're so small they don't have lag to begin with but if let's say you were going to go to a bigger T4 style turbo with a massive I don't know like the super style turbos and massive ones those ones if you don't have a ball bearing it's going to take forever to spool so ball bearing is ideal on those size turbos but since these are so small you don't need a ball bearing turbo I mean you wouldn't really gain anything since it spools up so fast already with the journal bearings. And then besides that, there's also two different types of center housings. There's a dry housing, which is basically this one here. It's oil cooled. There is no coolant ports. So basically oil comes in through the top, lubricates everything, cools everything off, comes straight out through the bottom, and that's it. It uses the, the engine block and the coolant basically. The heat transfers from the oil to the head to the block and everything, and then gets uh, expelled through uh, the coolant, the engine coolant. But these ones here, these are wet housings. These ones have oil ports. This is the oil feed, lubricates the bearings, everything comes out through the bottom. But it also has coolant ports here on the side, which you run engine coolant through it to keep these turbos cooled off. And um, it's whatever you prefer. I mean, there's a lot of turbos out there that run oil cooled and they're perfectly fine. But usually, since the SR20 came with an oil cooled T25, 
you just run an oil cooled turbo. I mean, you already have the lines there, why not? But as for something else that didn't have cooling ports, you might as well opt for an oil cooled turbo. That way, you don't have to have the extra lines and clutter that wasn't already there to begin with. Okay, now we move on to the topic of wastegates. There's two different types. There's an internal wastegate and there's an external wastegate. And a couple of examples here are basically the, the Kamak, the Godspeed, and the Factory Gear T25 are all internal wastegates. The reason why internal wastegates are more popular on, on uh, smaller engines is because they're more compact and the engine doesn't produce as much exhaust. You don't need a larger external to relieve all that exhaust pressure to control the boost. So basically, you have here a, an actuator, which basically is a diaphragm and a spring, a calibrated spring for seven pounds. As soon as the turbo builds seven pounds, it sends the pressure to the wastegate actuator. It pushes on this rod, um, opening up this flap here. Basically, it would open this here and relieve exhaust gases out. So it bypassed the turbine, relieve exhaust gas out to control the boost. So boost control is very important. You don't want to have any weird spikes or hiccups while you're doing a hard pull because then your tune's going to get thrown off. So this is internal wastegate. Basically, obviously, it just means it's internal, it's integrated, it's a part of the turbo. External wastegate is something similar to this. This here, as you see it, would be an internal wastegate, but I honestly don't know where the actuator mounts up or anything, but what most people do with these style turbos is they weld this thing shut and they run an external wastegate. So basically if you were to have no wastegate this turbo would basically freewheel and boost as high as it wants to and basically either grenade itself or damage your engine, blow a rod or take a piston out and detonate itself. So you don't want that, you want to be able to control the boost. So the best way, the most efficient way to control boost is using an external wastegate. It has a much larger orifice to be able to uh, expel more exhaust gas. But um, for more compact applications like mine, I can't run an external wastegate. So I, I have to use the internal. But if you were going to go for high boost, high horsepower, you would definitely need to run an external wastegate. And I don't have an external wastegate here to show you, but basically it mounts up onto the turbo manifold right before it hits the the turbo here and as soon as it hits let's say 25 30 pounds it cracks open and it starts relieving exhaust gas exhaust gases out through there so that's how that works and um, that's pretty much it so basically two types internal and external wastegate internal is more compact not as efficient because it's a smaller orifice you're limited to the size uh, external wastegate, it's it's not as compact. You have to mount it externally, and um, but it's it's a lot more efficient. You can expel as much exhaust pressure as you want to be able to control boost much much easier. Okay, so here are two actuators. So starting from the left, this is the factory one that Godspeed included on their turbo. On the one on the right is the HKS. Uh, actuator that I bought for the Godspeed Turbo, so I don't like this one. And this is the new Kamak uh, Forge Billet actuator. I mean, just by looking, you can already see that the Kamak one is much, much, much higher quality than the HKS or the the Godspeed unit. But um, basically, all this is in here is a diaphragm and a spring. The spring is what keeps the pressure on in there, pulling on the rod to keep the the wastegate flap shut. As soon as boost pressure goes into this hose, it'll push on the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a... How do I explain that? It's kind of like a, like a flap, a sealed flap. And you basically convert that 7 pounds per square inch of boost pressure. And it pretty much multiplies it by the surface area of the, the diaphragm inside to be able to push on this pretty heavy spring. And that's how that works. But that one, I personally didn't like because on the dyno, it started cracking open at about 10 pounds. I was reaching, or I was aiming for 15 pounds of boost, which is what this HKS actuator is is um, calibrated to. So I ended up buying this one, replacing that one on the Godspeed. I didn't have issues since. I actually really like this actuator. 
but um, as for the Kanak one, the reason why this one is superior is because it has these Allen heads here. You can remove this cap, and the spring that's in here you can replace with any of the springs that I mentioned in the previous video um, that range from 0.3 bar all the way to 2 bar, which is 30 psi. And um, as you can see, it's threaded, so you could adjust it if you wanted to through this rod, as you could with these two. But I, as I mentioned in the previous video, when you do that, you basically, to increase boost pressure, you make this rod shorter, which basically increases tension or preload on the spring inside here, making it, making it stiffer to pull out. But when you do that, you reduce the amount of movement that this actuator has to open the wastegate flap. So for visual, let's say I have this one, this HKS actuator, adjusted to 25 pounds. So I'm going to have to thread in this rod fairly far in to reach that amount of pressure. So when you do that, you're going to be applying more pressure here. But as soon as the boost starts hitting 25 pounds, it's going to want to push this open. But since you already adjusted so much preload, the rod can only open so far. Meaning, let's say it only cracked open, let's say that much, when it's supposed to go much further. You only, you're only expelling that much exhaust gas, which, I mean, isn't really well if something were to happen. This, the actuator and the wastegate won't be able to control the boost beyond on that. But with this one, you don't sacrifice rod length and um, shaft movement by adjusting this here. You remove the spring here and you change it to be able to control the pressure inside this little thing. So let's say right now it's at one bar. This will start opening at one, at one bar at 14.7 pounds and it'll open to its full length. But if you wanted to go to um, 1.7 bar, you just swap out the spring and you still have the same amount of travel opposed to this one where you have to adjust the length here and um, affect the amount of travel. So this one, the Kamak version, is much more superior to these um, threaded rod adjustable types. And it's much nicer looking.